men's rights activist, YouTube personality, all around personality, social commentator. You can find all of his information at Sotomayor, S O T O M A Y O R dot com or Sotomayor E N T dot com. Tommy, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Stefan, for having me. So, what brings us together, my friend, is the cause. The Cosby. Uh, I did a show on him a while back ago. He was a huge influence on me uh, growing up. I, I literally loved the man for his comedy and his gentleness and his wisdom and his shows and uh, all of that. And uh, man, it's been a pretty wrenching transition to see uh, what's happened. Of course, as you know, those out there, I'm sure know, just a couple of days ago, he was found guilty. The sentencing is what, 60 to 90 days from now. Guy could be facing up to 30 years, which is an infinity for an 80-year-old, basically 81 almost, I guess. And uh, yeah, he's facing decades uh, in prison. And uh, I think there's a lot to talk about. And I really appreciate you taking the time today. How's it been for you? Oh, it's it's been great, first off. And second off, you're right to listen to the the years thrown at, thrown at him. If he did the crime, yes, he deserves that and some. But it's just so long and so discombobulated with what happened how, that we don't know, that we don't understand, that we don't even get the era in which they came from. It's just hard at this point to just be cool with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is weird to think that it's close to half a century that he may have been perpetrating these acts, so the ones that he's found guilty for. The room has been floating around for a long time, and it is part of the general cover-up that has been going on in Hollywood. Like, I won't get into details, but I looked some other stuff up, and I figured out if it's a black-white thing. Like, did he go, you know, there are theories out there that, you know, the, the whites want to break bring down the, the powerful black man and, and so on. Man, there have been some blacks who got away some with some pretty egregious stuff. There have been whites who got away with pretty egregious stuff. To me, the question is always, who gets targeted and why? Because the guilt or innocence of these things, let's just say, well, the court has decided and that's what we kind of have to live with. But I'm always fascinated who gets targeted, who gets targeted and who gets passed over. That to me, and, and why at this particular point, you know, the Hannibal Barres uh, followed by the meme, like one of the worst ideas in PR history was like meme Bill Cosby and 90% of them were all like rape memes and so on. Yeah. Wh wh why do you think it took so long? Why do you think he was targeted when he was targeted? How did it come about at this time in history? It seemed like a part of what was going on during that era that a lot of people were caught up in the whirlwind of well, everybody's doing it, so I'll do it. Then it seemed like a lot of regret because um, one of the women stated she, well, she was like, I didn't even need to be drugged. I liked him so much. I don't know why he <laughs> drugged me. I would have done it. So if you go back on it, it could be a fetish of his because I do remember the Larry King interview where they spoke about it like it was commonplace. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he and Larry King are sitting there talking about how good it is to what you all the things you can do to a woman if you put Spanish this thing called Spanish fly in a drink. And I thought they're on the show talking about this like it's normal. There's no outrage. There's no backlash. So maybe the people from that era did think it was normal to the point of where even if someone didn't want something, you would do it because that's just the way of the world. So then it must have been something that was going on in huge numbers for men of that era. Uh, you got money you got in Hollywood. You were supposed that you were entitled to the women. So maybe they were mindless to them at that time. But what made it come back up is this idea that now you have um, empowered women. You have we don't have to take this anymore. And maybe some of the women who had felt like they were violated in the past decided to come forward, especially after seeing the success of what's going on now. Because you have to remember many of these stories, these women had told them prior. Just no yeah. one listened or no one cared. So that's the part I'm trying to rectify in my mind, that these women didn't just come forward today. They had come forward a long time ago, and many of them were shunned and pushed aside. So maybe it's just coming forward because of real cases that were pushed to the bottom. But I think a lot of the cases that are coming forward now are just cases of I want to get attention. Yeah, and, and e even before the guilty verdict that just came out. I mean, I, I watched the previous trial and, and I think the big difference between the two was I think there were five women who now had their stories who said that there was a similar methodology or modus operandi to his uh, attacks or assaults. 
So even if there are people out there, and I know that there are people who think, well, the, the women are just looking for attention, it's not real, you can't tell. Nonetheless, at the very bare minimum of where we are looking at the man's life, he was a relentless sexual addict, serial adulterer, you know, the, and okay, that's not great. You're married to a woman, you're supposed to be faithful, you know, you're religious, you're Christian, you're supposed to keep your vows. But when you put yourself forward as the moral conscience of not just the black community, the moral conscience of America, America's dad as a whole. It's the televangelist thing. Like, it's one thing if a guy uh, is, is unfaithful on his wife, not great. But if you are the televangelist who's been preaching about family values, it just, you know, like even the, the very bare minimum of what he did, I think has been really irritating. And I remember Hannibal Buress talking about yeah. this, you know, like he was really annoyed because he's like, Pull up your pants. It's like, yeah, but you're a rapist. That's sort of what got it going this round. And it's really be annoying to be lectured at someone who has this kind of past. Even if we take the rape stuff out of the equation, this serial adulterer, this preyer upon the, the star dreams of, of young women and so on, even at that level, it's pretty annoying to be lectured at by people who have that kind of history. And see, that's the thing. I didn't know that he had that history. I was never plugged into Hollywood. You have to remember the context of what you and I used to know about celebrities when we were coming up was what they wanted you to know. <laughs> right. The think about right. it. They wanted you to know this guy was a good guy. You thought he's a good guy. If you thought he's funny, if you thought he's a bad guy, if you, uh, if you, whatever you, they wanted you to think of someone. That's what they gave you. I mean, then we realized, wait a minute. Well, there's a rock Hudson and the image in that rock Hudson portrayed wasn't who he really was. And it, it just kept falling down. It was small things. Uh, then you learned about JFK and you're like, wait a minute. He wasn't, this great what way did you learn about the government wait a minute it wasn't this pristine thing and i think that's what this is i think a lot of this is peeling away our i, I guess it's our innocence almost yeah. maybe the young kids today understand not having it but us we don't because we were spoon-fed everything so we were spoon-fed that cosby's a great father he's a funny man he's a guy that loves the children and then to juxtapose it against what we are hearing, like you said, just on a bare minimum, not rape, just the fact that, like you said, he's a serial uh, adulterer. Um, the things about him, he almost, he's, he's lecherous. He just seems like a creep now, if that makes any sense. And that didn't fit the narrative that they were pushing. And I think many people from his era got away with it because they were, they were crafted in the studio and, and served to us. So we didn't know. And we wouldn't have had social media. So once Hannibal mm -hmm. Buress was speaking on insider information as if it was commonplace, I don't think anyone could believe it. Because I know I didn't. I, I couldn't believe that was him. And then it was hidden in plain sight. The interview with him and Larry King is right there. Well, he did these comedy routines talking about Spanish Fly yep. uh, way back in the day as well. And I don't know, Tommy, like I've, I've almost never experienced a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mm -hmm. moment. Like, I mean, okay, so you look at people like Roman Polanski, you, you, you look at uh, some of the other creeps who've been floating around Hollywood, the Harvey Weinsteins and so on. You look at those guys and you're like... Yeah, I can see that. You know, like, you know, this is there's not this big propaganda machine that's that's pointing you entirely in the other direction. It's like, yeah, I can kind of see that, you know, like Woody Allen stuff with his stepdaughter and stuff. It's like, okay, well, you know, I can kind of see that too. And but this this 180 from the public persona and a mm -hmm. guy like I genuinely loved as a kid. You know, this is back in the day, like at the at the LPs with the with the records needles that you had to put pieces of plasticine on top so they didn't keep skipping it mine would just skate all over the place the plastic mm -hmm. speakers and even then his voice which was a wonderful uh, bass sounded great and he was so funny so gentle you know the vupa vupa with the the i still remember that from when i was a kid his uh, whole skit on noah and just a, a seemingly wonderful gentle guy you hear about his charitable stuff the stuff he did with mm -hmm. temple university all of the people he put through college his 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 charities like everything that he did his show which was not just a sitcom but was also a statement and, and a very powerful statement to reorienting people uh, away from some of their visions of the black community and, and opening up this portal to sort of upper middle class 
values and so on that a lot of people hadn't really seen. You know, you're the black black exploitation films of the 70s portrayed, you know, sort of ghetto stuff and hood stuff. And here was this like amazing moment. And I didn't really experience it that way as a kid. I was just like, wow, this is really funny and enjoyable a show. But th- I, I don't think, like I, w- I was racking my brain before we were talking to me thinking, okay, have I ever seen a 180 in a public persona like this? To go from this guy that like, anybody would would be delighted to have in their life to potentially one of the most rampant serial rapists in American history. Like, I mean, yeah. I just, it's thrown my compass way off, way off. It's done that for me too. But like I said, I think the children of our era had our childhoods crushed at this point in time in history because we know way too much about people who we knew way too little about before. And then like you said, well, we would listen to the routine but even when he would sprinkle it with stuff like that, I don't even I didn't even pay any attention until somebody comes back and tell you years later he's done this. You're like, oh, there was reference here to that. Oh, there was this there. But I, I can't think of anything that would compare to that either. Yeah. Um, as far as somebody to go from something that wholesome, maybe, maybe like the the televangelists from the eighties, maybe the guys who they found out they were, they were cheating, but still Penn state would probably be the only thing, but then Joe Pa didn't do that. It was the guy underneath him that none of us really knew, but even that was shocking for a school of that large of following and passion and charitable work to be known for doing that, that long to that many children. But you have this one guy who was so wholesome that, he was one of the few black men who were just on television doing when I was growing up. It was one of it. It was a great thing to see because, like you said, other than that, we had good times, which was a black family that was poor and struggling, and then they didn't have the father anymore. And it was like that. Oh, and they had the, the Sanford and Son too, right? Which I also enjoyed watching right. when I was a kid, but it was kind of low rent, of course, relative mm-hmm. to the Cosby Show. Right. Like these were all professionals. These they they fit into the neighborhood they were. It wasn't this. They didn't even focus on race. So it made it feel like race didn't exist just for a, a 30 minute stretch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. was good. It was a good feeling to to have a discussion about anything other than race. And now we're back there, even if it doesn't exist, because if he was able to get away with this that long, he was circumventing race at a time in which other blacks felt like they couldn't. So maybe we Wait, well, what do you mean that. by that? What do you mean? If he was doing this for that long and everybody knew it and they still allowed him to get away with it and he was doing it to non-black women. Well, black people of the 80s and 70s that were not celebrities couldn't have gotten away with something like that. An accusation and it gets swept under the rug. So even if we relate to him and that's why I'm so torn, because even if we relate to him, we can't relate to that. A bunch uh, of yeah. white women go to a police uh, office and uh, go to a police station and say, we were raped by this black guy. A regular black guy would have been in jail. He's just now facing trial. And it's, this is something that everybody knew was going on. But it's the same thing with Harvey Weinstein. So maybe we have to look past the idea of color. Maybe we need to look to economics. Economics got OJ where he was, when a normal person would have been in jail. Right. Economics have kept blacks out of, uh, I'm glad you said it at the beginning, there have been a lot of blacks who've done a lot of bad things, just like a lot of whites who've done a lot of bad things, and both sides had their share of people who got away with it. When we were dealing with money, it seems like there's two things. The money gives them easier access to people who are trying to get it, but the money also gives them easier access to take advantage of people who are trying to get it. Isn't it horrible, Tommy, to think that the same money that gave him the capacity to help put blacks through college also gave him the uh, lawyers and the public persona and the marketing and all of that? And it's not just the money that they have. To me, it's the money they make for other people. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like the, the women who went to complain uh, to their agents and so on, you know, one woman was talking about, you know, I went to go complain to my agent and my agent said, well, you know, that our agency has been representing Bill Cosby for, for many, many years. And, you know, 10% of 400 million bucks, well, that's quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like once you're in a position where you can make millions of dollars for people, 
man, they just, they'll cover up anything. You, you can be cannibalizing a homeless guy on the street corner, and they'll be like, nah, he's just snacking. You know, man gets hungry. And it's like, if you can get it, it's almost like there's no more secure position to be in in the world than generating lots of money for other people because then they have this direct economic incentive to just play, you know, magic vanish with, with every untoward thing that you're doing. Like this Jimmy Seville guy in the BBC in the UK is sexually preying upon little children for decades, all covered up because he made a lot of money for people. Yeah. And, and you have to think about it this way. You're no longer a person, you're a business. And mm. when you're a business, people are willing to forgive a lot. And we already know when we see guys with money. I mean, the perception of money makes everything equal to a, it's like for men, you can have a handsome man and a rich man. The rich man is going to be able to attract as many women as the handsome man and probably more because of his resources. Now and for longer, because yeah. the money stays with you, the looks don't. That's right. Then you take that same individual and say, it's not just his money. Now he's a generator of a business or a culture or a thing that a lot of people depend on. So if you depend on it now and you work for this person and you see them do something, Harvey Weinstein, you see them do something that's inappropriate. But what do you do? You don't know if the women want it. Then you see that it looks like they're distressed. But can you be the one to tell? If you tell, you have a family at home. Your family depends on your wages. How, how would you feel letting people know I work for this type of guy. So it's mm. so much that goes through your mind because but when you first got the job, imagine. I remember when Bill Cosby reached out and he spoke to me and he told me that I was doing a good job. That was the best day of my life. I remember telling him he'd, he'd see my stuff. I was like, Bill Cosby, see my stuff. Can you can so, you tell a little bit about that? I, I heard you talking about that on one of your shows, and I, I actually do want to know the details of that. When did it happen? How did it come about? What was the conversation like? Uh, it was 2013. Somebody had reached out. And I, and I can't remember exactly. I just gave him my number. It's like same thing with Judge Joe, Joe Brown. Usually these guys, I would just give them my number because they, they would reach out and say something. They would usually say like, hi, good job, or I like what you're doing. Same thing with Roseanne Barr. I almost freaked out when Roseanne Barr called me. Um, but it was just one of those, keep doing what you're doing. Don't let people get you down. It was a small conversation. But it was the best conversation I'd had. I was like, I love this man. So then I found myself fighting for this man. But fighting as like a family member saying, well, he couldn't have been a bad guy. I'm a nobody. He reached out to me and nobody and, and, and tried to tell me to keep doing what I'm doing. So then if you find out something like this, the story doesn't sound as good. <laughs> it doesn't sound as good to say that that guy, you know, uh, Ted Bundy reached out to me and said, you're doing a good job. <laughs> right. like, the, the rapist gives me two thumbs up. It's like, right. oh, no, please. <laughs> no, 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 don't have that. No. Right. Like you just want to erase that one. Like in, in, in my movie, we were contemplating of if we should take out Russell Simmons because he was in the movie. And then same thing. You, you don't know. But if you love this person, it's almost like having some the police come to your house and say your family member did something mm. and you love your family member. You're like they never would do this because when you watch almost every trial here in the United States, the family doesn't believe a word of what's said about the person, even after they're convicted, even after they show pictures and videos. He was a good boy. He, right. he was turning his life around. He was, you know, <laughs> he was just, he was just going to go to college and everything. We had the paperwork, just hadn't mailed it yet. Right. It was in his hands on the night of the murder. Look at the blood. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he was right. going to drop it off. But it's, it's, it's that. And for me, I'm having an internal fight of, do I believe this is justice? Or is this justice overdue? Do you, is it justice or is it justice overdue? Tell me more about that if you don't mind. I want to make sure I follow that thought. Mm -hmm. Is this justice that what's going on with him now and the Harvey Weinsteins? Is this justice? Because you have these people who they have evidence, they have recorded statements of some of the women who were going after him saying, hey, I'm just trying to join the gravy train, get on there, get some of this money. But then you have the real cases. And if the real cases are real, then this is justice overdue because many of these people had to suffer and then be told to just forget it. Mm. But it, it just forget about it. I mean, it happens to everybody. It's the price of doing business. <laughs> and it's sad that a lot of people are put in there. It's the price of doing business. It's just the Me Too movement doesn't include another segment of people who are being used like that. And that's called men. Men 
have had to put up with a lot of stuff that they wouldn't have put up with in, in the Hollywood world, in the regular business world and all of that stuff as well, because how do you speak out? And then you get bullied for being a man and letting this or that happen to you. Um, you can't tell anyone about it. You tell someone about it, they'll look at you like you did something wrong. So most men have to set on it too. So no one's asking them about what happened to them when powerful people are pushing them or powerful people are influencing them to do certain things. So it's, is this not justice? Because maybe these stories are not true. And it's been so long that now we're going by old memory, which any investigator will tell you, your memory is like one of the worst sources of evidence <laughs> you have, which is right. weird. Your, your memories and, and eyewitnesses are like two things that is really, really tough to, to lay any case on. Yes. And yet this is what this is built on. And if we want to build a stronger system, do we really want to say something as flimsy as this gets you 30 years at, at 80 because it just waited, 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 and the era and the time was perfect to do this, to perfect to get this through now. Because you have to remember, had we not been in this era, this wouldn't have happened. Had they tried this five years ago, if it just went to, went to trial five years ago, this wouldn't have happened. But then you also have to look back and say, if he didn't do it, why did he pay these people? But then you also have to go back and look. A lot of companies pay settlements because they, they don't want the bad PR and they didn't do anything. I mean, the McDonald's coffee woman, that woman was an idiot, but they gave her a million dollars for burning herself. It wasn't their fault that she put the coffee on top of the um on top of the dashboard. It didn't make any sense. So the coffee is too hot. Now they have to go through all this stuff, but they did nothing wrong, but they had to pay. Well, uh, okay, there's, there's more to that story, but let's do that another. Uh, in general, I agree with you, Tommy. Like, uh, when I hear somebody settled, when I hear plea deal, I don't automatically assume guilt because, you know, I mean, the American legal system would get 15 million lawsuits filed every year, like 90% of them against people with money. To me, it's just yep. an elaborate suit and tie shakedown. So I don't go that way. And And what got him, of course, was this similar story stuff. Now, the similar story stuff where the women say, well, you know, this, he did the same thing to me, did the same thing to me. When you have a whole bunch of independent people who've not spoken to each other, who've not referenced mm -hmm. common materials, then that becomes more believable. But in the day of email and social media and you know, internet access and so on, the idea that it's impossible for women to coordinate stories. I'm not saying any of these women did, but there's evidence. There was a, a, a trial uh, up here of um, uh, a radio host, uh, John Gomeshi, and it turned out that the women uh, said they hadn't communicated. Then it turns out they had and, and it coordinated mm -hmm. and made an attempt to get this guy and take him down and so on. And so in the day of the internet, in untraceable communications to me, it's really, really tough to have that. Well, they're all telling the same story independent of each other. That gives it the flavor of truth. I think that's kind of hangover from an era where it was, it became almost practically impossible for people to coordinate stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes this so intriguing. There's an emotional tie because you like him or you think you respected him. There's a entertainment side because, well, you know I'm an entertainment, but you really don't know him personal, but you start transposing things that you see on entertainment as this must be who he is. He must be the pudding pop guy. He must be the, uh, hey, 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 he's got to be that guy. Nobody can keep up that front that long and to find out that, well, yes, they can. Um, yeah. And then to know. Life ruined and he didn't do anything. Um, there's a woman who came out now and it's been found out that she uh, blamed this football player. Come to find out that story wasn't true, but it doesn't matter because now the scarlet letter is on him. He's been accused. Yeah. So now other people can come out and say something. And, and it's so crazy. I just don't like the idea of something taking so long, so many, so many years and you can have really no evidence. Because I guess I'd rather ask you, how do you feel about the fact that a lot of st uh, states are adopting the laws of there is no statute of limitations on rape now. So oh, 40 man. years later, a woman can say, and she needs no evidence. You just got to be able to get people to believe this guy's a creep. Oh, I mean, I, I'm not a fan. Um, I, let, let, okay, let's talk about this because this, I think, is a really important thing. My question is always with this kind of stuff, Tommy. Okay, what can we learn from this as a society around prevention? And here's where I'm going to step into nice hot water. Uh, maybe you'll join me. Uh, maybe you'll just throw me under the bus <laughs> but to, to mix my metaphors. But okay. Young 
women who are very attractive, you know, the models, actresses, and so on, looking for a break in the business, go into the home of a married man, much their elder, you know, right? You know where I'm going, right? So, I mean, this used to be stuff you just wouldn't do. You don't go to a meeting at a married guy's house when his wife's not home and you're alone, and then you don't accept alcohol, and you don't accept pills, and you just don't do stupid stuff that is going to put you in trouble. And this does this does nothing. And people get then think, oh, you're excusing what he did. I'm not excusing what he did. I'm talking about prevention. You know, if, yes. if I take my Rolex and I put it on a bench in New York City, in Central Park, and I wander off and I come back the next day, it's going to be gone. Now, does that mean that the guy who stole it was not a thief? Of course he was a thief. But why am I leaving my Rolex on a bench in New York City? There's things that you can do that are somewhat smarter than go into an older, powerful guy's house who's married when his wife's not around and no one else is around, taking drinks, throwing them back, taking handfuls of pills, throwing them back. That's stupid stuff. And it's like we used to know this stuff really, really well. Women used to care about their reputation. It's like, no, I'm not going to take that meeting. This is, you know, I don't know this guy. But it's just like, oh, here's an avenue to fame and riches and wealth. Yes. And he's going to be my acting coach and he's going to be my mentor. It's like, you're not that interesting. You're 20. You're 18. Some of them were underage. I mean, like, I'm sorry, you're hot. You're not that interesting, most likely. And he's not inviting you there because he thinks you've got Marlon Brando's acting talent. Sorry, I just needed to get that off my chest. I'm all done. Wipe me down. Take it from here. I, I Look, they need to have a picture of us with the little yin and the yang. Black and the white, except for my face and your face. Because <laughs> people need to understand this. Common sense does not stop you or your color does not stop you from either knowing or not knowing common sense. Common sense used to be, there's no way you'd go to a guy who says, come meet at my house at, uh, no, come to my hotel. And he's married and he says, come there about 12.35 a.m. And you just show up thinking that this is really going to be business. When you know, if I if I had asked, that's what bothers me. The women know they're not, <laughs> they're not dumb because if I ask and I'm broke, hey, why don't you come over to my house at one in the morning? You'd be able to run some lines. <laughs> right. The same thing would not pass. But then uh, one of my friends, uh, Jerry Stackhouse, was an NBA player. And I remember going to a party in Detroit. And there were girls who thought I played on the team. Well, I can't tell the story, but things happened that evening because they thought I played in the NBA as well. And I didn't have to do anything but just sit there. And I remember thinking, this is awesome. These guys' life must be great. People throw themselves at them. And they were the most beautiful women in the world I'd ever seen. Now, I knew I couldn't have walked up to a woman in my everyday life and said, hey, I want to take you, 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 and all of those girls upstairs and do whatever I want to do. But you listen to any celebrity and they tell you stories of how they actually were able to do things like that. So that same individual who would let loose and do whatever with this guy because he has money would all of a sudden gain morals when you're broke. So she has the morals. She has the common sense. So we're allowing people to do whatever. And again, I'm stepping in the same hot water as you. Here's what we're doing. We're saying women are not responsible for their actions. One of the things that bothers me so much is this idea of myself and a woman can go to a bar. Myself and a woman can go to that bar and drink and both get plastered. Myself and a woman could come home and decide that we, we wake up the next day and we're like, oh, my God, I think we had sex. She can go to the police and say, I think I was raped because I don't I don't remember drinking that much or I didn't think I drank that much and I, I blacked out. I would have been just as drunk, but the police won't say you both did a drunk behavior. You're drunk and I'm supposed to be, no matter how drunk I am, I'm supposed to be able to understand something. I don't like that idea. I don't like that men, if a man gets drunk, he lays down with a woman. He normally would, would um, protect himself. But on that night, his inhibitions were gone. She ended up pregnant. He said, I didn't want the baby. Do you think they're going to charge her with rape or let him off the hook from paying child support? No, they will not. Yet the women are getting off the hook. They can do something at 20. They could sleep with 98 guys, then decide that I don't want that on my resume because I'm 40 and those 98 guys have it on video. So I'm going to say they all rape me. Look at what's going on in New Orleans right now. There are three military men who are being charged. I don't know if you've seen the story. Three military men being charged with rape by two women who took them home after the bar. 
who said at first they started off and they think they were willing, they were, they were willing participants with some of them, but not the other ones. And they were going back. It was the weirdest, most convoluted story that these women were able to say, well, we were drunk. Well, they all were drunk. So why is it that they're not held to a standard of, like you said, I have the Rolex. If I leave it on this park bench, yes, it's messed up that this guy picked it up. But now I'm going to tell you, and it's funny because I used to give the same analogy, sort of. I would say, yes, I have a house. Yes, the house is mine. But if I leave the door unlocked and people say, oh, my God, they, they, they cleared out your house. They cleaned it out. And the police was like, well, did you leave the door unlocked? And I was like, well, yes, I always leave the door unlocked. Well, they would still try to catch those guys. But they would also tell me prevention from here on out. Why don't you lock the door? I mean, I, we get that you have the house. We get that you feel like people shouldn't rob you. But that's why we have laws, because they are broken at times. So could you not be a little more diligent in protecting yourself? And we're not telling women that. We're not saying be a little more dil- diligent in protecting yourself. And that scares me because we're putting all the onus on men. Well, of course, you can either have, logically, you can either have deference or you can have equality. You can't have both. But of course, if you're offered both, <laughs> I want equality <laughs> when it suits me and I want deference when it suits me, it's kind of hard to say no to that devil's bargain. And the idea that alcohol somehow excuses or, or makes things better or worse, of course, I mean, somebody goes drunk driving. Uh, we, we say that they're fully responsible because they got drunk, uh, they got into a car, and we understand that they have reduced reaction times, reduced mm. coordination when they're driving drunk. So we pile on more uh, to, to what it is that they're doing. But the idea that, well, you're going to have a different kind of drunk driving, you know, a drunk uh, slap and tickle, and that means that you have no responsibility at all. It's like, well, you, everybody knows what it's like to get drunk, and well, most people do. And, um, you know, you, you're kind of responsible for getting drunk. And what happens after that? The idea, well, you know, I did uh, run into this uh, house, but I was drunk, officer, while I was driving. And they say, well, obviously, then it's the people's fault for putting the house in the wrong place. I mean, this would never happen in any other equation. And that's what I, I, I'm that's why I was saying it's it's so hard right now for me in this situation, because I've seen too many men get railroaded. And we're not talking about that. The system allows men to get railroaded. And the one thing you never see feminists come up and talk about equality with is when you see the large amount of women who are purposely marrying rich men to get their money, divorce them and take in half. None of those women come out and say this is not equal, equal. Look at the sentencing laws with men who commit mm-hmm. the same crime that a woman commits. Remember, you have whenever a woman says he raped me. That man and all of his information is put out in the public, whether he did it or not. He's looked at as a bad guy immediately and his life is ruined. The Duke lacrosse players lost everything on a lie. And and and, and, sorry, just to point out for those who didn't follow that story. The woman who came over, the the, the dancer who came over, uh, was not uh, prosecuted for false accusations or anything. And she ended up, what, she got involved in a murder, right? She, so she so because she wasn't prosecuted and put away, someone ended up dying uh, as a result of this inaction. And you, you sorry to interrupt, but your question about, like, you know, in, in infinity of, of time can go by and so on. Well, of course, there's no physical evidence. And of course, it's he said, she said, but... The only thing that would get me even 1% closer to accepting it, Tommy, would be, okay, well, if the woman provides a false accusation, does she get prosecuted? Does she get Thanks. the same criminal sentence as she would ha- as the man would have had if she wasn't lying? And in certain- it does happen eventually after maybe the fourth or fifth time and the police just get tired of doing it. But uh, women being prosecuted for false accusations seems very rare. And that's another one of these one-sided things. Right. And we have this thing already, law set up, perjury. So as yeah. soon as the person gets into court and gives false testimony, they should immediately be charged with this. But when you have individuals who know I can make claims and if it's found out to be false, nothing happens to me. My life is not ruined. Rape shield is such a great thing. Well, wait a minute. How is rape shield such a great thing? But we don't have shield for that guy. Why don't we work the whole thing out in court first and then we'll let it out? Say, if that's what we're going to do, we're going to protect this person, then protect that other person, too, because we know whose life is generally ruined in these situations. Not the person who did the accusation, but the person who's accused. If a woman accuses a man of slapping her or beating her, nobody looks at her as a bad person when they find out that he didn't. 
uh, it's just, oh, well, well, we found out and she's a bad. She, you know, she should have not done that. And then they move on to the next case. They don't say, well, let's put her in jail. Let's make it to where when we get this, because as you stated earlier, um, the United States of America is a very litigious society. We're just suing, 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 always in court. So maybe we can cut some of that down by having some type of repercussions for people who lie. This should be something happened. Why have the perjury law if you're going to allow women to perjure themselves to ruin men's lives? Then at the same time, we never want these powerful men to take what they have and use it against other people. But and they keep this a sentence full of butts. But I still got to say, you know, this 60, 70 year old man would not even have access to this 22 year old. (laughs) had he not had money. So we're allowing these people to come in and try to steal people's money. We're allowing these young girls to marry these old men and take half of their money. We're allowing all of these things to happen. And yet, as soon, like, the 20-year-old marries the 50-year-old. They get a divorce, she takes half, they laugh at the old guy. The 50-year-old marries the 20-year-old, he cheats on her, hurts her feelings, she was really in love, and he goes off with a 19-year-old. They say he's a dog, he was too old, he should have never done that to her. And I was trying to say on my show one time, I said, there are way more young women who use old men than the other way around. Yeah. Nobody wants are, to are you saying that Anna Nicole Smith did not marry that crypt keeper in the wheelchair for love? I, I, I won't <laughs> believe it. You can't make me disbelieve in love, Tommy. Don't take love away from me. <laughs> now, do you think that he got away with this? For so long, I was sort of trying to think of an analogy, and this is a strong analogy, but let me know if you think it plays at all. I wonder, as people say, well, why did it take so long to to come out? Now, the fact that Hannibal Barras is black, criticizing Bill Cosby seems that is almost needed. To, to It's like, well, he's black, he's saying it, so I can't be called a racist for calling Bill Cosby a rapist because... I'm black. And it's sort of reminded me of what's been going on in England for the last couple of decades, really since the 80s, that you have these Muslim Pakistani rape gangs that are preying upon hundreds of thousands of little white girls in, in, in England. And they weren't prosecuted. They weren't pursued a lot of times because people were like, well, we don't want to be called racist. Now, I wonder if there had been some Muslim police chief from Pakistan who had decided to, you know, do the right thing and go after these guys, then he would have been immune from that. And I wonder if it took a black comedian to to call out Bill, Bill Cosby in, in a way that people weren't going to say, well, I'm not going to say it because then I'll be called a racist. 100% correct. You are 1,000, 100, 1,000. Because think about it. Sad. I can look at myself. Um, you know, I don't have a rape shield, but I have a black shield. Like I can typically... <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that, powerful. a black shield. That's it's good. just as powerful and... Just, just more, a lot more useless. But I, I pull it up every now and again. It doesn't block many attacks, but <laughs> it blocks that one. I can't right. be called racist. Now I can be called a coon in the sellout, but I can't be called racist. And it allows me to say things that you may not be. Because when you talk about the race dynamics, you have to put on your feathery slippers and try to say it in in most empathetic way as possible. A fact, like it'll be a real fact. But because yeah. the fact has a black face on it, you it doesn't matter. I'm still called a racist. But yeah, it's it's <laughs> nice to th- you, you like to think that if you put on the feathery uh, shoes that you can dance your way through these. Hey, no mines here. <laughs> you know, but no, I've been listening to him by Jesse Lee Peterson. I, I know that it's important to talk about these issues. But yeah, you're right. I, I, I mean, the, the black shield is, is an important aspect of these things. Mm-hmm. So you see someone like that, he's not going to get backlash. Jerry Seinfeld got on the stage and said like that is this white guy attacking this great black guy and we're all going to go after him. Um, the problem with Bill Cosby, though, is he lost his uh, black shield because when he started criticizing the black family, he opened himself up. This, that's what my issue is. I criticize the black family. So I have the shield where I can do it and not be called racist. But now I'm no longer black. And black people will throw you to the wolves. They're like, well, do whatever you want to with him because he criticized us. And Bill, had he not done that, because remember, we, they, we knew nothing about O.J. Simpson except for he was a good football player. And yeah, we're a little upset that he marries a non-black woman. But I mean, hey, I mean, he's in television shows and movies. So he represents us. So when they're going after him, we're going to stick with him. We didn't feel that way about Bill Cosby. And we wouldn't have felt that way about O.J. Had, o. had we known that O.J. said, I'm not black, I'm O.J. Had we known that, his black shield would have been taken away. He would have been kicked out of Wakanda, and we would have, <laughs> and he would have just been done. But 
Bill Cosby, he had been kicked out of Wakanda years ago because he spoke about the sacred cow in the black community, which is black single mothers. You cannot attack that group because that group holds the most power amongst us because that mm. group is given the power by the government. So, again, you have that. Then you have here in Hollywood. Look at all the powerful men in Hollywood who've toppled over. Who's given the women the power, the ability to do that now? It's a good thing. It's a bad thing. You can use a knife to, to, to fillet a fish, to fillet a person. It's a tool that can be misused. And right now, the power is being given to women and there's no checks and balances because when we find out they're lying, nothing happens. So, yeah, Hannibal Buress was able to come out and say this, but Hannibal Buress was speaking for a lot of people, white people included, because when you see more white comedians and more white people in entertainment come out and say, we kind of knew this about Bill, though, like that was what he did. That makes you kind of sick because I was one, well, me because I was one of the people defending him and I still do in ways. And I think like you, our issue isn't that we defend a person. We defend a position like I'm not defending him because he's black or him because he's white. If he's white and he's right, I don't care if he was in the Klan on this issue. He's right. And it's like, I don't think you can do that anymore in America. You have to argue people. So if you disagree with this person's actions or you disagree with that, that person's whole life and you disagree with that person's whole race and you, you, you and you're homophobic, too. And you're like, no, no, no. I was just disagreeing with that thing. And Hannibal Buress allowed it to where people who had already disagreed with that thing can now come out and say it because a black man said it first. So we're not racist for repeating what the black guy said. <laughs> oh, it's so terrible. I mean, it's so terrible because this fear of the word racist to, to the point where you're willing to look like, let's say that the, the worst accusations are true, not just the ones that were proven, but, you know, the dozens and dozens, like 60 plus women going back. And these are just the ones we know about. Let's just say he was this horrible Jack the Ripper serial rapist guy. And people are like, well, we don't want to say anything about it because we don't want to be called racist. And it's like, but women are being drugged and raped and preyed on and cast aside like an old Doritos bag. And it's like, is the word that powerful? It's like the same thing in England, but we want to call racist for calling out these Pakistani Muslim rape gangs, even though Islam, of course, not a race. Uh, it's like, so you're going to let these girls be tortured and preyed upon and threatened with guns and set on fire and, and drugged up and made into addicts because you're afraid of two syllables? Like, how has this word become, you know, like I watch some of your shows and I'm like, Ooh, I don't think I'd have enough shields in the universe to make some of the arguments that you're making. And I hate that because I do want to be able to speak freely. Race issues are important. It is, you know, we need to have these discussions. And I was told, you know, let's have an honest conversation about race. It's like, no, they don't really want an honest conversation no, they don't want about that. race. Yeah. <laughs> they just say that to lure you out so they know where you are. And it's like <laughs> that they would actually sacrifice these women's life and, and mental health and, and bodily integrity and security because they're afraid of being called racist. It's like, wow, that word is bigger than some of the worst crimes that you can imagine. No, look at it. Look at right now. In America, as a white person, when you, um, what was the numbers? I think it was 28 times more likely to be robbed or murdered by a black person than the other way around. So that on, on its face, common sense, if it was the other way around, that blacks were that more, much more likely to be assaulted by a white person in, this, in the United States, which it should be that way anyway, since we're so far outnumbered than them. The, so it would make common sense that they would be attacking us. But it's not that way. It's the other way around. If blacks were to say, I am afraid of white people because of these stats, no one would say they're racist. As a matter of fact, Blacks get to come out every day and say how afraid of white cops we are when white cops kill more white people than black people and black people have more interaction with white cops than white people. But we're still able to get out and say, I'm afraid of them white cops. They're going to do something to us. And it's bad cops. The white cops are bad cops. Even though the percentage is less than 1% and 1%, it's a small number. But let's just go ahead and go with that. So if we're able to say that, why is it that people can't say the opposite when we are leading in the bad category? They can't say it, though. So that lets you know something's wrong when facts become racist. And when did the word racist have so much power? But it's the same as homophobic. If I don't agree with anything this person says, 
that is homosexual, I just became homophobic. And I fear being called homophobic because I can lose my job. And that's what's going on, Stefan. People yeah. are losing their careers over these words. Getting labeled a racist when it doesn't even have a clear definition anymore is destroying people's lives. Getting labeled a uh, sexist now is destroying people's lives. So if you're a guy, if you look on television, you're seeing these ultra effeminate guys who have like no sexual drive at all. You got to make sure they don't. While the women on the stage cackle and laugh about uh, Thor's six pack and how they'd like a guy. And I'm like, okay, so they can objectify a man in this society now. They have a commercial out there where there's a guy, two guys walking into a, a office building and it says, when the hottest guy in the office comes in and the girl's looking at him because the guy's hair's flowing in the breeze and he, he's, he's got a nice tight shirt on. She's mm, objectifying it. Then it said, yeah. and the second hottest guy comes in the office and it's like this ugly guy. He's not, not a handsome guy. And um, the, he looks over thinking that he's going to get the same attention from the girl. And the girl turns and looks down and starts working. And he looks at the camera and said, it's a small office because, you know, he's the second hottest guy in the office, but he's not cute at all. But I was like, you notice this dynamic. Could they have done that commercial with women today? The exact same commercial. Could they have done it with the hottest girl in the office coming in and she's being objectified by the guys? And in the second one, she's being ignored because she's not as pretty. Because remember, we can't call a fat woman fat, but a fat guy is a fat guy. We can't call an ugly woman ugly, but an ugly guy is an ugly guy. So we're going down this road of inequality means equality. Um, taking power away from men is somehow empowering women. This yeah. is the problem I'm having with these stories because I don't know once you allow one thing, you're going to allow it all. The floodgates are going to open. Once you start listening to one person's story and saying, yeah, we can go back to whenever. When does that stop? Yeah. And this, you know, I tell you, this is one of the reasons why things with, with Bill Cosby threw me off so much, Tommy. It's sort of like you see the little weedy guy go into the biker bar and throw his weight around, you know, and just like barge up against people and not worry about spilling his drink on some beer bellies. And you're like, man, that guy got some serious jujitsu, man. He's got to know some Kung Fu if he's doing, doing that kind of stuff. And when I remember this, this was back in the 90s. It really sort of peaked in the, in the 2000s, like there was a 2002 speech. I made a couple of notes here during the NAACP commemoration of the Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Bill Cosby said, and I quote, no longer is a person embarrassed because they're pregnant without a husband. No longer is a boy considered an embarrassment if he tries to run away from being the father. And he had the, you know, the, was it the pound cake speech where he's talking about like, pull up your pants, turn your cap around, speak proper English and, and so on. And success can be yours. And I remember at the time, I mean, I was aware enough uh, uh, back then to say, man, this guy's got to be squeaky clean. Like, there's no way he can have any skeletons in his closet because he's taken on single motherhood. He's yep. taken on government dependence. He's taken on ghetto culture. He's taken on thug culture. He is, like, putting some ownership and responsibility back in the black family, the black community. He had this one speech where he's saying, like, stop spending your money on sneakers and start spending it on books. And economists did actually do the math. And they said, okay, well, blacks and Hispanics spending 30% more of their disposable income on whites on bling and crap, just, you know, for status and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I mean, I'd heard a couple of rumors, but I'm like, well, they can't be true. Because there's no way he's going to wander into this minefield if he's got skeletons in his closet. And now that this has played out, like, I'm absolutely astounded at, at the... I mean, that's that's courage to the point of like, I don't know, taking on the dinosaur with a toothpick. Like, I mean, if you've got this amount of junk in your closet, why would you start poking that bear? I mean, that just seems like a, a self-destructive act that, that staggers the imagination. Well, you know, I can explain it to you because I did the same things. Like, Please do. <laughs> Please help me. Help me. Like, help I'm myself. Clean in the least. But if you see a problem is destroying not. Like you can watch one or two people. It is sad, but you can watch one or two people self-destruct. But when you watch an entire segment of people that look like you mm. self-destructing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It seems like at a certain point in time, you got to stand up for what's right. It's, it's, it's the Moses thing. Moses, you lived in Pharaoh's house. How dare you call it out now? Well, I didn't see it. 
when I was in the house until someone pointed it out to me. And I realized, wait a minute, this is really bad. I could live in this house. Think about it, Moses, the, the story of Moses. He could have lived in the house, lived like a king and, and, and been in power. No problem. But he had to turn away from that. He put himself in position to go and be with the people who were being oppressed than to be with the oppressors. It takes a lot of, a lot of guts to do that. What would push a person to do that? Integrity. You look and you say, I, it doesn't matter that I'm benefiting off of this. This is wrong. And I think I can save more people than myself, even if I do it. So maybe he's kind of throwing himself on the cross or maybe he didn't think the backlash would be as bad as it was. Like I didn't because I thought, well, if you're telling people the truth and you put numbers behind it and then you tell them, you know, things will get better. If it, it's like, yeah, forget forget the black white shield. It's just I have the truth shield. I have right. the magic power called facts, reality, truth. Honor, integrity, and a genuine care and compassion for yes. the people that I want to help. Because he wasn't just going at black people and trying to, and, and it's the same thing I get. We're not just going at black people because, first off, it wasn't lucrative. So I hate when people say that. Oh, you're just doing it to get money. Who who makes money doing it this way? You make money doing it the other way, making blacks professional uh, pro, uh, perpetual victims. Therefore, they will always give money to you so you can be their victim mouthpiece. Doing it the other way around, there's no rich guy who made money off of talking bad about black people and telling them that here's the problem. A lot of the problem that's going on in your community is you. But once you do all of the calculations, do all of the permutations, and you say, it all seems to really boil down to the individual. Then the collective that has the individual's mindset. Maybe if we change that, we could change the circumstances just from what I've seen, but they don't want to hear that because that means I can't blame someone. That means everything that's going or the majority of what's going wrong, I can either make it better or worse. And that's too much pressure on me. I don't want that responsibility. I want someone else having the responsibility. So when it goes wrong, I can blame them. He didn't think that telling the truth would. He had been getting away with so much so long for so long. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. Surely he thought that I could get away with something that's right. If I'm doing things that are wrong and I'm having no problem. And that's the cautionary tale we need to look at about Bill Cosby. As long as he was towing the company line, he was able to do whatever he wanted. Yeah. As soon as he stepped out. Now we're going to look into you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is something I've noticed about the Democrats or the left. And it's really kind of, I mean, it happened with JFK and, and Ted Kennedy got away with like well, mm -hmm. the stuff that Chabaquitic, which is just mind blowing, but particularly after, you know, the other BC, right after Bill Clinton, where, <laughs> I mean, he can just do the most egregious stuff and just lie his ass off and, and get away with anything. It's like, well, if you've got, if you've got bad stuff in your closet, that's where you want to go. You want to go on that side. And that to me, it, it, with, with Bill Cosby, it's almost like this, Bill Cosby won who's like Huxtable, right? Who's, who's that, that Dr. Huxtable. And then there's Bill Cosby too. And it's like, they don't even have a phone line between them, you know? And, and Dr. Huxtable is like, well, I can go and tell things to the black community about responsibility, self-ownership and, and keeping your, your marriages stable and, and keeping your, your families together and, and turning away from nihilistic thug culture. And I can do all of that because I'm Dr. Huxtable. And then there's this other guy in his brain who's like, here, have some quaaludes and I'm going to like do horrible <laughs> things to you with a fork. And it's like, they've got no line between them. That's sort of how it seems to me. It, it sort of works. And again, this is not no psychologist, but it just seems like how can you start poking at the single mom in the black community and, and so on when you know that you've got this big pile of like largely white women's bodies behind you with like your semen all over them and quaaludes coursing through their system. It's like, that's kind of nutty. And I can't, I can't put that those two things together. Individualism versus collective collectivism. Mm. As an individual, he did things. It's like uh, when I was little, we walked past the wino. You tell him old, I call him a wino. Um, but you walk past the guy and he'd have a bottle of alcohol and he'd be homeless and looking dirty and he's out on the streets and he'd look at you and he'd say, don't you guys get mixed up with this alcohol? It's bad for you. And then he'd keep drinking and think, well, if it's bad for us, why are you doing it? And I think that's what Bill Cosby ran into. 
individually, I like weird sex and my wife allows me to do it, but I'm raising my children and things like this. And because I understand the value of family, no, it's like the Kennedys. They understood the value of family, if, if nothing but on the face. But he also understood the value of he liked a, a nice little romp every now and again with Marilyn Monroe. There was two different people. Mm. I think most men, in essence, are two different people like that, where the collective, I don't want to see the collective get hurt. This thing I'm doing is individual. It's an individual thing that I'm doing. It's an individual proclivity to have. But as a collective, if everyone was doing this, it would be wrong. If mm. everyone was doing this in large numbers, it'd be bad. Like when when I was coming up, you could listen to Two Live Crew. It was bad music. But there was also music that had no cuss words in it at all. So as long as you had different things, you didn't really think bad about it. Well, nowadays, all the music sounds like that. Nowadays, all the music on the radio is that. So do you sound like an old fuddy-duddy when you say, this has gone too far? When someone can say, but you used to participate in that music. Well, yeah, but it wasn't like this. It was, you know, it wasn't this. It's like being the guy who produces out of wedlock children. Are you now precluded from saying having children out of wedlock is a bad thing? Right. So is he, because he's done this to these individuals, in his mind, he was thinking, I did this to individuals who in a way probably deserved it because the only reason they were there was because they were trying to get my money anyway. So that's maybe what's making it okay in his mind. You yeah, you want to use me, so you. it's in yep. some amoral way. You're using yep. me, so it's fine for me to use you. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's what's going on in his mind. And then when you say, set it around, okay, but when I go out in public and I walk around and I see what's going on with these people who look like me, who I've made this television show and I made this cartoon to try and make us better. Because remember, he was basically talking about the family structure allowing more money to come into the black community to allow them to be more stable. I don't even think he was really talking about the moralistic aspect of family. He's talking mm. about the financial benefit of a family. The And it's true. Even if you say you're not in love, just the financial benefit of staying together and having the children together far outweighs this whole liberalistic view of women can do whatever they want to as long as we compensate them. As long as I remember, them. sorry to interrupt, but I remember as a kid, Tommy said, my parents got divorced when I was a baby. And I remember as a kid, like in, in some fairly crappy rent controlled apartment, and I saw a picture of the house my parents had before they got divorced. And it was like, oh, that's nice. That would have been really nice to grow up in. I can still see it very, very mm -hmm. clearly. It's a, a really lovely little house. I'm more than a little house, a medium-sized house and so on. It's like, it'd be great to step back in time to when my parents were still together before the, you know, financial mitosis blender of all assets got turned on and everything went to the lawyers. It's like, that was that was a bad call as far as having any kind of resources stay in the family went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it, and it's, he seems to have been tapping into that part. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, he was right. And whether he's the correct spokesperson or not. And to me, it goes back to Moses and, and, and the Moses story. And Moses was like, let, was telling God, let Aaron speak. He's, he's better for this. You don't want me to be the one to do it. I'm not prepared for it. I'm not good at it. He's uh, more well spoken. And I think we want to prepackage our, um, heroes. And what we've done now is made it to where no one can speak out. Because as long as you can call out some dirt in their past, you're going, they can't say anything. It's, it's a perfect, it's the perfect society right now for degenerates. Because, well, and, and I don't, I don't require moral heroes to be fanatically pure. I, I don't think anyone does, you know, like there's Jesus and then everyone's like way down below, right? So I don't require moral heroes to be perfectly pure and to have no uh, blemishes, you know, you can still get a sunburn, at least I can, even though there are spots on the sun, right? So I don't require this purity. Now, this is way, way too far. And my sort of concern now is that the message that Bill Cosby had, which again, I'm like in my brain, I'm still struggling to separate. You know, it's like trying to pull apart uh, uh, drinks you've mixed together now, trying to separate these things, because I actually appreciated and, and strongly advocated for some of the stuff that Bill Cosby was talking about in the 90s and the 2000s. And now, of course, it's like that message that he had about self-ownership, about responsibility, about not being a victim all the time. Now it's just like, yeah, but he assaulted over 50 women. So it's like, baby, bathwater, boom. And now what? Now, now, I mean, there's people like you, I guess people like me and so on, like trying to talk about this stuff. 
<sighs> but it's a shame that such a public advocate of a reasonable position has just rolled on a grenade of his reputation and, and shredded uh, a very important message. Well, because you have to remember, no one's able to make that call. And I think that's the genius of the, the left. The mm. genius of the left is you could have been a Klan's member, but if you vote Democrat now, we're going to show how you progressed. Right. You right. can be a Republican and you weren't in the Klan, but because you voted Republican, you're probably racist anyway. So your past can be forgiven as long as you step to our side. If you step away from our side, no matter what your past is, we're going to dig it up and we're going to say you do not have the moral standing to make this call. And what it is, is we're going to take away morality at all because, well, the left is because they're saying if you're not perfect, there's a problem. Mm. Unless you're with us, then you can be as imperfect as possible. And we'll use that as like it's 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 one of the endearing things about you that you're not perfect. Democrat, liberal, but if you're a Republican, everything about the Im imperfections of your life, we're going to bring them up and we're going to use them to say, you can't say this thing. So with Bill Cosby, it didn't matter with any black person. There are no um, blemishes on Ben Carson as far as like him doing anything. He's been with his wife. There's no he's cheated. There's no anything. Blacks didn't care. He's a sellout because he's a Republican. Didn't matter. He does not have the moral standing to tell us how to be. And when he talks about family, they throw up in his face. Well, your mom raised you by herself. And he's like, yeah, and it, it was it still wasn't good. It doesn't matter what I made of it. Why not? In your Rolex case, why not have some prevention? Why not do that? And it's like you cannot tell black people this because they just want to be told it's not your fault. So it doesn't matter who it is that's telling them if you're not going to tell them it's, it's not their fault, you will become the enemy. So Bill Cosby became the enemy, and now everything that's being said about him, black people didn't care. He's the enemy. You went against the sacred cow, you're the enemy. Well, and I mean, the same thing happened with Clarence Thomas, you know, yep. a brilliant legal scholar and a brilliant legal mind and, you know, dragged through every conceivable amount of mud. And this is a funny thing, too, and, and you've talked about this a lot in your show, so let's, let's, let's touch on it. You know, there's no wire that we won't together cross our arms and touch and just, you know, so um, you'll see our skulls flashing in, in our heads. But as far as, you know, calling out sort of black family, calling out single motherhood in the black community, it's, you know, in the white community, um, you know, I call out single moms and, you know, of course, then you hate women. You just hate women. It's like, no, no. I mean, criticizing people for bad decisions is not the same. In fact, you criticize people that you care about. Yeah. You know, n nobody criticizes the guy who's like, I don't know, got an IQ of 30 who's drooling on himself saying, well, I can't believe you didn't get into graduate school because you have no expectations of improvement. No expectations of improvement. And the fact that you criticize people is an act of respect. It is an act of love. It is an act of encouragement. It is not a hating act to criticize people. In fact, the worst thing is when you give up on criticizing people, it means you've given up on their possibility for improvement. And so the idea that, you know, you criticize a group, it means you hate them. It's like, no, 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 no. The, the group you really hate are the group you don't even bother to, to criticize and encourage. And in the, certainly in the white community, there are, I think, a lot more men calling out single moms than women. And I think that's even more true in the black community, because I do see, you know, yourself and, and others and so on calling out the single mom phenomenon. But I, you know, I'm racking my brain. You may know, I mean, you probably would know a lot more about this than I do, Tommy, but I'm trying to think of a black woman who's been doing the same thing or what might happen if she did. Um, there was one. In the oh, eight. <laughs> You're racking your brain here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was one in uh Shahrazad Ali. Shahrazad Ali called this out in the 80s, used to go on Geraldo. And Geraldo went out of his way to make her look like a kook, hmm. a horrible person, a fanatic, a black woman who's probably become one of those crazy Muslims. And she preached against what is happening now and she was villainized for it she was um looked at it they would find everything she said wrong or maybe that was inappropriate and throw it in her face i think she talked about um women the equality between the physical force saying that you know if you don't want to 
get into an argument or fight with a man, then don't put your hands on the man because if you put your hands on the man, he has every right to, to hit you back. Well, that wasn't anything that was going to fly back then. That's what we call equality. <laughs> right. That That is perfect for equality. I mean, you watch television shows. If a woman is cheating on a man, she gets to slap him in the face. And everybody's like, yes, he deserved it. Like, wait a minute, what? So if a guy gets, he catches his woman cheating on him, if he slapped her in the face, would we say, yes, she deserved it? No, we wouldn't. So where's the equality in that? But Sherazad Ali is the only woman who did it. And she was basically ran off for Mm -hmm. doing it. She was destroyed by the left. And at the same time, the women aren't going to do it because, like you said, it's hard for them to go against something that they could one day benefit from. Mm -hmm. If you're a woman, you know. I could do some dumb stuff and I can still get an abortion if I'd like to. So even though I don't believe in abortion, I'm not going to fight against it because anything could happen. And I'm I'm a woman I can benefit from. It's like uh, reparations. If they were offering reparations and I'm black and I'm rich, you think I'm still going to turn down that extra check? And that's what women are getting, an extra check. So they're not going to turn it down. Um, In this situation where a black woman could step out, we have a situation where In the black community, if a black man dates outside of his race, they call him a sellout, a self-hater. He hates his mom. Why are you dating a woman outside of your race? It's a big issue. But when a black woman dates outside of her race, they give a ticker tape parade. Whenever a white man wants a black woman, black women are excited. The number one show in America for black people at one point was a show called Scandal. And Scandal was the white president with a white wife screwing around on her with a black woman. Do you think that show would have been number one or lasted as many years as it lasted had you just had a black president with a black wife cheating on her with and in love with his white underling? Do you think how long you how many episodes you think that show would have lasted? I think less than one tenth of one percent. She comes (laughs) on the screen and you've got like activists raining down on the entire set, you know, smashing up the uh, the uh, the lights. And uh, oh, yeah, no, that would have been. That would have been pretty bad. Yeah. No, I mean, this is very much a double standard. So you have to then ask, why would a black woman step out? One, she could because she has more leeway. It's the same shield that I have. It's not a powerful shield. It blocks a couple of things, but everything else gets through. Um, She could have done that. But why do it when you benefit from both sides? We had one of the greatest black poets out there. Um. What was her name? The one who died. Maya Angelou. Hmm. Maya Angelou was married to two white men. Nobody's ever thrown that up. Nobody's ever said, how can she be for black people when she's married to a white man? Uh, Meghan Markle. They did an ABC story. I made them take it down, of course. ABC did a story saying, does her marrying this prince give black women hope? I said, hope for what? So I did this whole thing and they went back and they had to change the title. You can go and Google it and see it. They changed the title, left the article up, but changed the title. I was like, hope for what? Hope they can get a white man? This is really ridiculous. What? In- hope that hope that they don't have to marry a black man? I'm like, can you imagine? Right. And 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 I was I said, the liberal mindset is is ridiculous. Had this been written by anyone else, it would have been immediately considered racist. But because This is written by a black woman who's encouraging this behavior because other black women believe, you know, if you want to prove that you've made it, a white man will say you're attractive. And I said, this is ridiculous. There's even a book out there, Stefan. And it's the 10 ways to help a black woman get a get a white man. It's an actual book. And the first tenet in that book is get rid of the black girl attitude. So they're admitting that black women treat black men bad. And if you're going to get a white man, you have to be sweet. And I said, this is crazy. You could never have this kind of book written by a black man saying, let me tell you how to get a white woman. It'd be look ridiculous. And number two, if a white guy said, let me tell you how to get uh, a white woman said, let me tell you how to get a black man. You got to understand in our culture today, a white woman wearing wearing um, braids or um, any kind of black hairstyle is criticized for it. While the black woman is walking around with a long blonde mane. It, 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 it makes no sense. And liberalism and, and, and this whole PC culture is doing this, is destroying us from the inside out. So, no, there's no black woman who has done it recently. And nor will they, because what incentive do they have to fight against this machine? 
It is, uh, you know, it used to be, of course, the deal was that uh, you, the woman had to be, you know, a good wife, a good mom, a good friend, a good housekeeper, a good companion. You know, if she wanted to work, that was fine too. But she had to be a good woman for the man to choose to marry her and to stay with her because there was no plan B. I mean, I guess there was a plan B, like you'd go to your church and and you'd beg for charity, but, you know, that was pretty humiliating. And I, I rem- I'm old enough that I remember when the sort of first generation of people who ended up what in England when I where I grew up was called pogey or or you'd go on welfare and, and it was like considered so shameful. You know, like it was just it was so terrible. And of course, like all things that that um that was kind of a hangover from when you'd be on charity and that stigma kind of went away pretty quickly and now it's empowering or whatever it is. But it used to be that the woman had to be wonderful for you to marry her. And as sort of the welfare state has displaced the man of the house and replaced it with that anonymous check that you don't, you can be as nasty and vicious and mean and catty and ugly and, and brutal and unfaithful as you, I mean, the check's still going to come. That's not the way that it works in a voluntary marital relationship. And this process of, of welfare undermining female virtue by making male virtue less valuable, less important, uh, means that women can now indulge in petty lust and they can go for the bad boy and all the stuff that, you know, sometimes in their cycle seems to be dictating their desires and so on. There has been such a terrible sort of quicksand below female virtue in particular, I think related to the welfare state that... Um, it seems almost unrecoverable at this point. Like if the welfare state vanished tomorrow, I wonder if it'd be like, okay, well, I ah, guess we're going to have to be a whole lot nicer and we're going to have to learn yeah. how to cook and we're going to have to give people back rubs and I got to give them a foot rub and, you know, whatever it is, right? I wonder if it's even possible to recover that sort of degradation of female attitude that I think has been somewhat driven by the welfare state or whether it's too late. And if they don't remove that net, because women and men are both, walking this tightrope men are walking it with no net and they're 100 feet above the ground women are 100 feet above the ground but the net is 100 i mean the net is 99 feet up so they don't fall they feel real comfortable doing the most silly things because they get to bounce and play around on the net and then get back up on the rope whenever they wanted to and that's what women get to do they get to play around with morals they get to play around with oh these men need to be faithful when you see the 70 percent of all divorces are enacted by the female when most marriages are enacted by the female, the most marriages, the, the, the guys are running around saying, I'd like to go through this big marriage ceremony. It's a woman saying, well, we've been together five years and you're still not going to marry me. Blah, blah, blah. So then she pushes you in a marriage that she runs out of. And nobody's pointing this out. Another number of fact. It's not an opinion. These are facts. And yet these people are beginning to dictate how I go into it and how I get out of it. That's ultimate power. Yeah. And they're not going to give that power up. And the only way that power is going to change is if the welfare state is completely abolished. As long as it's as long as you're being told women and men are equal, but a woman's not calling you saying, hey, let me take you out to dinner in a movie because I want to get to know you. You have to tell her that I actually had a woman who said pay for my company and pay for me to go on vacation. I'm not lying. She said, uh, oh, I, th- I think you're handsome. I thought she was actually trying to date me. And she was like, um, you want to spend time this with the woman you happen to find on a back page ad or anything? No, is it, tell it, me? Was, it was they moved their ad. They've moved their stuff to Instagram, regular stuff. And you think I figured it out. I'm old. Like if they have booking information on their stat uh, <laughs> on their um, information, the booking means you can pay for them. I did not know this. So I'm sitting there and the girl was like um, talking and they they nice walk into it as I'm really pretty. Right. You think I'm really pretty? Well, um, I need money for my time. And, and I was like, I was on vacation. And she says, I would have went with you. I said, you would have went with me. She says, yeah, I would have, uh, you could have flown me there. It would have been like four days, been $5,000. I said, are you kidding me? I would have had to pay you to go on vacation with me. And you would have got to enjoy the vacation, got money to come there too. Like that'd be the greatest thing in the world. If I could go somewhere and get paid to do it. But many women, that's why plastic surgery is, is so big. Now all the women look alike. They all go to the doctor. Even if you weren't born with it, you can go out and buy it. To the point of where now men are able to go out and buy it and look just as good as the women. So now they all look cookie cutter and they all want the same thing. You want my attention at cost. Then you have people like Cardi B and people like that who are, um, excuse the language, but I don't have any other, who are whores who are rewarded for their whoredom. Listen to what she's talking about. Look at what she does. And she gets to tell them, look at how better my life became the more I stripped and the more of a whore I became. 
Oh, the fact Tommy, that they have a campaign I mean, called No Slut Shaming, <laughs> but when have men said no dog slaming, no shaming? We still get shamed for being a dog. Why can't they get shamed? It doesn't make sense. We live in a world, Tommy, I was just reading this before we had this chat this afternoon. We live in a world where a porn star is suing Donald Trump for defamation because you see, she's got a reputation to maintain. You know, she, she, you can't be putting down the porn, you can't be impugning the porn star's character. That's just wrong. And it's like, are you kidding? What kind of planet are we in where, well, you know, I do have those excellent gangbangs on tape, but by God, you'd better not call me a false liar because that's terrible for my, oh my, it's like, wow. Well, look at that part of it. You make a deal. He completes his part of the deal. You made this deal. Then you just break the deal and say, nope, I think I should be able to talk about our sex. I think about it this way. A man can't use revenge porn to get back at a girl who you felt used him. But a woman can have a website called Don't Date Him Girl. It's an actual <laughs> website where they put your name, your picture, all of your information and their one sided view of why they shouldn't date you and tell and, and ruin your life. But you can't do the same thing to a woman, even if a guy's divorcing a woman and he gets spousal support because it's the very few times in which he's. Living off her. Society looks at him as a bad guy for doing this. A guy who takes custody of his children. For all these people saying men need to be in their kids' lives more. When men get custody over a woman, they look at him as a bad guy. You can't take a child from a mom. You're a dog. Well, she's a crackhead. I know, but you, you could give her money so she can get the rehab. And that's what we're doing. It's, it's, it's a wealth distribution. The whole men and women dating now is just wealth redistribution, taking it from one place, giving it to another place. And why are they doing it? Because the one place that has the wealth is irresponsible with it. 70% of all commercials on television are directed at one gender. Right now, we have men dying at about 10 years younger than women. If it was the other way around, it would be a huge campaign of we need to save the women. We got to find out what's killing these women early. But nobody's <laughs> saying that about men. Well, and uh, if you look at the false paternity stuff, that's just a yeah. I mean, it, it, you just take some, some silly number, like say that there's indications that it's higher. But let's just take 10%. 10%. 10% of men are raising a child not their own. Can you imagine if the hospital got 10% of babies mm. mixed up? And, you know, 10% of women were going home with just the wrong baby. You know, it kind of looked similar. You know, we got them shuffled around. Sometimes, you know, like <laughs> you, you, you find a tag on the floor. You just put it on some leg or some wrist. You know, like you can't be bothered. You got to look stuff up. You want a coffee break. If 10% if, <laughs> if of women were going home with the wrong baby, Beyond society me. would lose their shit like you would not believe. They would go completely mental and there'd be a reform in 10 milliseconds. Now, in some places... You can't, uh, you can't even find, uh, you can't even get a paternity test without the woman's, um, now some, some, so without the woman's permission, now some people say, okay, well, it's only 1%, 10% is too high. Okay, 1%, let's say it's 1%. Okay, if 1% of women were going home with the wrong baby, you'd still, everybody would be going insane. Look at the suicide mm -hmm. rates, look at fatalities in the workplace and so on. Like I just saw this, this show was being put on. 5,000 feet under the ground, the Virginia miners are digging out coal, and it's like, they're all men. Of course they are, because there are not a lot of feminists saying, well, women are unrepresented in the mining community. <laughs> Come on. Right. I, t I tell people all the time, look at any old video of a skyscraper in America being built. Mm. What do you not see on that building? Women. You don't see them. And who do you not see complaining about it? Women. You don't hear them saying, we need to be, we need to, be able to walk skyscrapers. No. We want you men to continue to do the dangerous jobs to where 92% of all workplace injuries are happening to this one gender. And imagine if that stat was flipped. 92% of women, well, we need to fix the workplace. These women are being put in hostile territories. These women are not, no one cares for women. Look at this, 92% of the workplace injuries are women. This is ridiculous. But because it's men, no one even talks about this stat. Homelessness, men are just out on the streets. 
Nobody points that out. A woman, it's hard for a woman to be homeless because somebody's going to pick this woman up and they're going to give some kind of program. They want to help this woman out. If my car breaks down on the side of the road, nobody's going to stop and help me. I'm on my own. Woman's car break down on the side of the road. Four cars have stopped to help this woman. We're not pointing out that we're making it really easy for women to have no morals at all because they have no <laughs> morals typically revolve around responsibility. The more responsibility you want you have, to vote, the more you get the draft, you. right? Yeah. So it's it's sad. Uh, I watch every year. I watch the NFL and the NBA draft. I see the same storyline. Some black guy who spent 18 to 21 years of his life, no father. Only thing he had going for him was his athletic talent. His athletic talent takes him to a place where he's about to basically win the lottery. Standing beside him is his mom, his aunt, his sister, and all the kids, no father. And the first thing he says was, if he went pro early, which happens a lot, I had to leave college because, well, I need to bring in some money because I need to take care of my mom. Love you, mom. If it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be here. Yes, if it wasn't for your mom, you wouldn't be there, sir. Being a husband to your mama instead of being a son. Because Peyton Manning and Eli Manning didn't have to give one red cent to their mom because their mom married a guy named Archie Manning who set things up to where their kids could be kids and form their own families instead of taking care of a family in which I put them in position to. But you hear black people talking all the time. I'm one of nine siblings. I went pro and I had to pay for everybody's stuff. It's my job. A guy came on my show. His name Philip Buchanan. Philip Buchanan was drafted in the first round by the Oakland Raiders. On the day of his draft, when he was drafted, his mom gave him a, a bill. The bill totaled a million dollars. She said she wanted a million dollar check because she raised him. Your mother says this to you. Oh, and I mean, I'm sure you've known people like this. I, I have a heartbreaking series of, of guys I knew when I was growing up. Because, you know, when you grow up, when you're in a single mom household, you end up, you know, you sift down like you're gold on the bedrock. You fall down through the economic ladder and you end up like just above the bottom and everyone around you kind of have the same dysfunctional family structure because the, the people with the functional family structures, they're not in your neighborhood. They're not in your line of, of, of fire. And so I, like, I grew up a lot of these guys and the, the worst, most terrible combination is uh, the, the single son of the single mother. Oh man, that is recipe for the end of the bloodline, like end of the bloodline, man. Like from 4 billion years from like little protozoas having sex, it all led to you. But because you're the single son of a single mom, boom, that's it. No dating for you. Mom's got to keep you close. Mom doesn't want to get lonely. Mom's going to, you know, make you food and is going to have you stay home and is going to just tend to her and rub her bunions. And it's like, oh man, that is one quicksand that it seems very, very hard for young men to get out of. And it is so fundamentally selfish you know like you you want to raise your kids to to go out in the world you know like you're drawing back a bow and you launch the arrow up you want your kids to go out in the world and achieve and so on and if you have a spouse the empty nest syndrome isn't nearly so bad but if you're a single mom in particular um and it seems end up in the world yeah it's most of these I, I talk about that a lot on my show about how difficult it is to date men like me who come from single parent households because we don't we don't really know how to be a man because we didn't see one. So if we didn't see one, then how do we treat a woman? Because we didn't see a man treat a woman well. So it's two things we lose out on. And if you're watching these single parent households, you're 100 percent correct because I've seen it to where the girls are actually mistreated a lot in these homes because the mothers don't value the daughters. They value their sons. Because there's competition with their daughters. As a ch as a girl ages and turns into a woman, she's sucking the youth out of her mom. She's becoming mm. what you were. And she's a mirror. And then you have people walking up to the mom and saying, oh, she looks like you when you were younger. And so now the thing that women are valued by, because men, we're still valued by what we bring home. So even if we're in our 50s and 60s, as long as we make enough money, we're still valued. Women, nobody's running after a Whoopi Goldberg, no matter how much money she has. There's not a bunch of dudes lining up to do that. Women, the most powerful thing they have is their youth. So their daughters take that from them. The older the daughter gets, the older they get. The sons, there's not that competition. So it's easier for them to get closer to their sons. 
And one of the things that really I saw growing up that hurt me because it happened in my family. Women did things that men don't do. If you have a father in a home, no matter how much we're struggling, I'm not going to be proud that my daughter went out and did porn or strip to help pay me pay bills in our house. But mothers, they're okay with their sons going out and selling dope. I had an aunt who had mm-hmm. my cousin who, when we were 16, he was out in the streets selling dope. He's in jail now for life. And he's been there since we were 21. That was his adulthood, though, from 16 to 21, taking care of my aunt, who allowed him to sell the dope inside of the projects, inside of her house. If she cared about him, one of the first things she would have done is say, if you're going to do something like that, because I didn't raise you that way, you're going to be here destroying the other people in this community with us by giving them this stuff just so I can have a big screen TV and a leather couch still living in the same place, though. I'm not going to let you do that. You got to get out. No, she didn't say that. She welcomed it. And I've watched, and you can do it. You can do the research yourself. Watch a lot of these single mothers. They will put their kids through anything just for the selfish reason of they want to survive. They want to float. They don't care where the money came from. There are many of these strippers, uh, Cardi B talked about it. Many of these strippers are going out and doing the most disgusting things for money and then coming home and giving the money to their mom because they feel like in the black community, it's our job to take care of our mom. Tupac Mm -hmm. had a, a line in his song. He said, even though you were a crack fiend, mama, you always were a black queen, mama. But that didn't make any sense. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Would you ever hear these people refer to their fathers like that? No. Even though you were an alcoholic, you were the best father ever, you would never hear them say that. Even though you weren't. But women are getting passes everywhere. When a woman gives up her kid for adoption, they say, took a strong woman to realize she didn't, couldn't give the child the house he needed. And when a woman gives a child up for adoption, guess what she doesn't have to pay? Child support. But a man who's not prepared to be a father, he's getting ready to go to college. He's too young. Everybody knows it. He can't stop that train. He has to get a job. And if he doesn't get a job, you no kind of man. And you're like, but he isn't a man. He's he's 17. He didn't know what was going on. So she gets the past. If she wants to go to college, she can give her kid away. She can give her kid to the, the parents while she goes off. She's never called a deadbeat, no matter what she does. Again, this dude who doesn't want this child, if he says, I don't want to be a father, I want to sign this paper and say, I give all my legal rights up. Well, he can do that, but he can't give up his legal rights to have to pay for it. So he still has to pay for it, no matter what's going on. But that woman can just leave that kid at a firehouse. And she's not criticized for it. That's not fair. That's not right. And if you have a society where the bringers of the children can be as irresponsible to leave a child at a fire station or a police station, and she gets no repercussions for that, nothing. She moves on with her life and we're never calling her out. So if 20 years, she now has a husband and three kids, we never point out about how many other kids that she didn't take care of or that she aborted. But a man he gets called out for any behavior that looks like that. And it is wrong and is contributing to the delinquency of a culture. Right. And to, to bring it back to Bill Cosby, I mean, I think that, I mean, his childhood, obviously, like it does with all of us, Tommy had a, a big role in shaping how he turned out. I mean, his father was like a violent alcoholic, beat up his mom. And then his, um, uh, Bill Cosby's father ran away and joined the Navy. You know, I mean, it's it, there's this old joke. I can't remember with some rich guy who's like, I'm going to sail around the world on a hot air balloon. And it's like, okay, we get it. You don't like your wife. You, you, you need some time. You need some private time. You need some time. Oh, like you're willing to go uh, into a, a hailstorm in a hot air balloon. You don't like your wife so much. And it's like, I'm joining the Navy. Not, you're not patriotic. We get it. You don't like your <laughs> wife. She's she's like shrill Rosie Perez, uh, kind of nasal talk. And so, of course, you know, his, his mom worked, his father's away for months of the time. So Bill has to become the surrogate father. Bill has to become the mama's little helper and, and raise all the other kids and so on. It's real hard to have a, any kind of childhood when you get promoted to like Sergeant Major, Major Daddy at a really early age because your parents are just not there, not present, not raising the kids. And uh, I think that it ends up with people having this kind of shell of a personality, like the personality needs to grow organically through enjoyment. I mean, you're a dad, I'm a dad, we know how this kind of works. You want the child to grow sort of organically, but when you're kind of wrenched up and, and, and placed into this way too adult role way too early, I think you develop this kind of false self, like this shell of competence. And, and inside there's such an underdevelopment of the organic aspects of the uh, personality. I mean, for those who want more, I've got this truth about Bill Cosby. It's a whole presentation before all of this, but about his sort of childhood and all of that. 
And I just, my heart breaks for all of the kids who you see sometimes on the videos, like the, the mom smoking dope in the car and the kid, you know, with these haunted, like the, in the, in the strap, uh, in, in the seat strapped in just this like haunted look of like, oh no, the people who are in charge of me have no self-control, no self-respect. And it's like looking down this tunnel of time and this slippery slope to hell itself. Yeah. And it's, I have a series called Around the Web where I just pop in on people while they're live on Facebook or live on Instagram or wherever they can go live. I just pop in on them. And just to show you, look at what they're doing every day in large numbers. How many of these mothers, there was one mother who got up and was smoking. She had what looked like to be a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, a girl and a boy. She was listening to the most degrading to females, literally music I've heard. And I've heard and made some of my own. So it bothers me. It must be pretty bad. So I'm listening to it. And the kids are walking past and she was smoking the weed on camera on Facebook Live. And I have it on my, on my website, but she's smoking the weed and uh, the music is cussing. And she walks out of frame for a second. And the little girl walks in and does the exact same dance as she was doing to and mouthing the words to the music and then started saying the words to the music. Every foul word. She walks off camera, the boy. And I said to myself, at what point do you think that boy is going to ever have respect for women when? He sees his mother half naked doing this twerk dance while a normal mom would be at least getting breakfast. She made no breakfast for the children. She, they put their own clothes on while she talked to the camera, cussing and smoking. And you know those kids, if they didn't get high from the contact, they are going to go to school smelling like this weed. And if it was ever brought to the attention, the black mom would be indignant to all of it. You're racist for bringing this up. You're trying to take my children away. You look at how many children have been murdered by women and it's their own mothers. And yet this is not considered an epidemic in the United States. Uh, the woman who drowned all five of her kids in Texas, they blamed the man for getting her pregnant more than they blamed her for have, for, for killing the kids. He's a bad guy. They said he should have known she was suffering from this stuff, yet he kept on getting her pregnant. So she did no jail time. She's out on uh, free now and she drowned five of her children. But the guy is the bad guy. Right now, you have people making fun of John Wayne Bobby. There's a, a whole documentary coming out now. She cut his penis off, and it's hilarious. It's been hilarious for years, ever since I was young. Yet there's no stories of a guy uh, mutilating a woman, and we think it's funny. Name that story of a guy who's mutilated a woman, and we think it's funny. Every time a woman does something to a man, we ask, what did he do to cause you to do this? Every time a man does something to a woman, they never asked, what did she do to cause you to do this? You just shouldn't have done it. Yeah, that's uh, tragic. And I like, I can't imagine, Tommy, I can't imagine going through life with this whole team of people to just cover up and excuse yep. and explain away everything. You know, this is the great curse of the hanging heavy testicle life, right? Which is that there's not a lot of people just sitting there saying, well, you're 150% responsible. You know, if, if, if you have an affair on your wife, you're just a despicable human being. But if she has an affair on you, well, she's lonely and you weren't giving her what she needed and she needed to go find solace in the arms of another man. You bad guy. And so, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I, I, it would be weird. I think it's too heavy. Like the burdens that are put on men these days, 150% yes. responsible for everything. I'd rather have that though, than this weird helium headed, excuse everything, no responsibility, endless victimhood, people just rushing to cover up all your mistakes and throw money at all the stupid things you do. Like that would create such an air of delusion and, and unreality and vanity and narcissism. It's like, I'll take the heavy burden over the helium stuff because I, you know, it puts you too much in contact with the ground, but I'd rather be in contact with the ground than floating around in these candy floss clouds and nothingness. But isn't that what Chappaquiddick showed us? You had an, a, a brother who had been oblivious to doing anything he did wrong. They covered it up. So he just continued to do wrong. He continued to feel mm. that, that, that air head, that helium head of no matter what I do, they're going to fix it. No matter what I do. And you continue to let someone go down that road of no matter what I do, they're going to fix it. They're not going to just all of a sudden wake up and just say, I should be accountable for my actions. <laughs> right. That's not life for them. Remember life for us. Had we not seen anything different, the single parent life would have been normal to us because like you said, we were surrounded by other people like that. Mm -hmm. I would have never known a difference had I not seen a difference. When I started hanging around my white friends and they had fathers, and their fathers were in the house. I remember thinking, this is weird. 
I only knew one black guy who had a father in the house, and we made fun of him for having a father in the house. He got picked on because he had chores. We didn't have chores. We didn't have yards. The government, we, we lived in the projects. Uh, if there was a goal in, out there, the government put it up. We go up and tear it down, tear the nets off. So instead of telling us to stop tearing the nets off, they put up a chain net, which 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 was just a challenge for us. So we's like, we'll see if we can get that down too. <laughs> so, right. so it was strange. We never appreciated anything because it was given to us. We didn't appreciate it. Had those homes been something that we had to build from the ground up, there wouldn't have been trash everywhere. We wouldn't have spray painted the walls and stuff like that. But because they weren't, we didn't appreciate any of it. Now, as I grew up, I started to realize giving free stuff to people is not a good thing. <laughs> well, it's never it's free, too. You got to take it from someone else first. So I think parallel to all of this is the very interesting situation that's kind of erupted. Although for people who've been watching Kanye West, it's not kind of a new thing. I mean, he's been a pretty radical free thinker for quite a while. There have been rumblings. There have been sort of hints and inclinations. People with a long radar have seen it coming. But man, there's sort of rip and space time continuing among Democrats, Republicans, race relations and so on. Just saw a picture of Candace Owens hanging out with Kanye and so on. That to me is really quite fascinating how much of a threat to establish power. Kanye just not hating on Donald Trump, wearing a MAGA hat, uh, talking about how he likes what Candace Owens has to say. And where do you think that's uh, tearing up the continuum in this way? It's so weird because we as black people love to tell everyone how diverse of a culture we are and how diverse of a people we are. Yet we have to be a monolith. You have to vote Democrat. You have to uh, feel like blacks are old reparations. You have to feel like whites are inherently racist and you have to treat, teach them not to be racist. And even then you got to give them like a, a racist patch and they have to put it on every day to make sure that, you know, it, it shuts down that racist neurons. They keep firing in their head. And whites now, whites are allowed to be Republican or Democrat. You don't hear white people saying you're a sellout to the white cause because you don't do X, Y, Z. So it's a weird thing that you watch someone like Kanye West, who, no matter what he says that's bad in his music, that is teaching misogyny, that is teaching drugs and all that stuff, that's fine. But how dare you vote or say that Donald Trump, your current president, is doing a good job because, well, he's got policies. And this is what John Legend, one of his friends, said on a radio show. John Legend said, well, he's got these policies that are racist against black people. And I kept asking the question, name the policy. Can you, can you, can you yeah, tell you a brother which the of these policies are? That would be very helpful. Right. I said, you can't just say the word. And then I kept saying, no, you can because you're liberal. Because when you're liberal, you just use scare tactics. You say words that 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 emote feelings from people that you didn't even teach them what those words are. Like You, you say, don't have to study anything because you got a label. Yep. And and and, and it's, it, it, yes, it's, it's the GUI society. I don't have to know how to program the computer. I just press the button. Um, the, the McDonald's workers. They don't know half of that stuff. They got a big picture of a Big Mac. And you press that picture and then that's <laughs> it. And that's what liberals have become. We don't want to teach you what these words mean. We just want to tell you that if, if someone's labeled this, it's bad. And so if they label the other thing, it's good. So if you call a woman a queen, you don't have to know anything about her past. She's just a queen. And if you call a, a, a guy a coon, if you call a guy a sellout, if you call Donald Trump a racist, and they kept saying, well, Donald Trump has all these racist policies that he's enacted against black people. And I said, please tell the audience what these policies are. Surely you want to educate them. And they never did. So 30 minutes, he just kept saying the same thing over and over again. The thing I like about someone like Kanye West, if anything else, your job in mind, Stefan, Stefan should be to make people think. That's all. Not think like us, but just think. And that's all I want people to do. And if you look at what Kanye West is doing, that would be what he's doing. But we want to ignore that and say he's racist against his own people. When you can look at the unemployment rate amongst blacks, lowest, why would he still be against? And I knew, I knew that. This is what's so frustrating sometimes, Tommy. Sorry to interrupt. But I, like, I, knew, I knew that going in. I knew that this guy knew how business worked. I knew that the tax cuts were going to help the people at the bottom of the economic ladder. I knew it was going to be great for blacks. I knew it was going to be great for Hispanics. It's one of the reasons why we've got to talk about immigration, because massive third world immigration is driving down the wages of the most vulnerable in society. Yes. Control for immigration, lowering taxes, opening up business opportunities. That's going to be great for the black community. I knew that from the very beginning of starting to talk about Donald Trump, yet still somehow to some people I'm anti-black, even though I 
supported a guy who was going to be great for the black community in terms of getting people onto work. And But if, I think they're afraid that if the black community starts working more, they're going to start caring a little bit more about taxes than welfare, and they might drift over to the more free market position, which, you know, they can't co-opt from, from that side of the aisle. Mm-hmm. And and that's like you. I said the same thing. The job of the president. I mean, he, he says idiotic things. It's just stupid stuff. But many of us do it. Black people are brash people. We just are. So you can get us in the middle of a train and we'll be loud on our phones and we'll be loud to you. We say what's on our mind and we've allowed we've been allowed to say what's on our mind. And earlier you gave a great analogy. And it's funny because I talk about that in my show. I called a lot of people in the black community snack pack throwers. And the reason I came up with that uh, terminology is because I remember being a kid and there was this table and the kids were throwing their food up against the wall. And I remember it. And I, so I asked the teacher, I was always an inquisitive child. I said, why is he allowed to throw his food up against the wall and he's not getting in trouble? But if we did it, we would get in trouble. And she said, oh, it's because he's special. Now, as I got older, I realized I was like, what's so special about him? He's drooling. He's dead. I don't get it. What's special about that? Because as a kid, I took the word literally. Then as, a, as I grew up, I understood, like you said, well, the expectations for that child because of the limitations of that child were low. But the expectations of us, which is why we got in trouble, were higher because our mental capacity was stronger. To whom much is given, you know, the rest is saying. So I started to realize, wait a minute, I would call the people in our community snack pack throws because I think a lot of society is looking at us and just not expecting anything from us. So, yes, you should want welfare. You have to be a Democrat. You're black. Don't you want a, don't you want a cookie or something? You want something given to you because you can't get it yourself, right? And that does not help that group grow. So when you listen to someone like Kanye West support Donald Trump, he's not saying that Donald Trump isn't a racist, isn't a bigot, isn't a sexist. You don't care. But what the great thing about him or the conservative party is that they're saying, whether we like you or not, if you build it yourself, we'll allow you to do it. We'd rather you get it yourself because we don't want to give it to you. Why wouldn't someone want that opportunity? If I'm not mistaken, that's what blacks have been begging for since we got here. We don't want to hand out. We just want the ability to be able to get it ourselves and not be messed with. Well, and this is the fascinating thing that came out with Chance the Rapper saying that uh, you don't have to be a Democrat if you're black. And, you know, he had to walk that back. I mean, the guy got a shitstorm and he's, you know, he's not as established and and independent as as Kanye would be. So, you know, it's all easy to criticize other people, but he's a rapper, not a sort of social commentator. But the fact that he would even tweet something like that was, to me, an amazingly brave act. The, The walking back stuff, I don't particularly care because the walking back is as instructive as what he said, because he said something completely obvious. Of course, you don't have to be a Democrat if you're black. And other people were saying, hey, maybe you don't have to be a Democrat if you're Jewish. Maybe you don't have to be a Democrat if you're a woman. And it's like all of these are perfectly obvious statements. Of course you don't. That's called diversity. And the fact that he was attacked for saying that you don't have to be a Democrat if you're black, and the fact that he was attacked to the point where he walked something back, which is a publicly difficult and kind of humiliating thing to do, it really exposes the machinery that underlies a lot of these narratives, this machinery of, of control and, and brutality and abuse and attack and the holding hostage of entire populations for the sake of votes. Uh, that, to me, is incredibly instructive. And I think we are kind of seeing this lid lifting uh, at the moment. Uh, how far it goes, I don't know. But, but it is something amazing to see that those of us who've been talking about this machinery of control and subjugation and, and, and um, manipulating entire populations to stay dependent on the state uh, and somebody who actually starts talking about diversity, seeing how they're attacked, uh, it is causing a lot of false narratives to kind of collide. And that creates a lot of heat and a lot of light and a huge amount of opportunity. Yeah, you. if you think about it, there used to be a time where you could sit down at the dinner table and have a discussion because mom liked one candidate, dad liked another candidate, and they would have that discussion. As a child, you'd watch the ping pong match, and you understood how to debate when you got older and still love each other because you see, I mean, it's not a, politics is not a real thing. It's an idea. It, it, it isn't. So to the point of where I no longer want to speak to my aunt because she voted for Obama or I don't speak to my uncle because he voted for Trump and stuff like that. It's gotten to that point to where there is no diversity of thought anymore. And if you're black, you really have no diversity of thought, dress, music, 
If you're black, you got to listen to rap. How dare you listen to country? You're a sellout. <laughs> uh, but then we claim we created all music. If you're black, you have to dress a certain way. But we claim we created style. If you're black, you have to talk a certain way. But we claim we created diversity of language. If you're if you name your kid, I get made fun of by black people because my name is Thomas because you're Uncle Tom and Tom oh, is a right. bad thing. Yet if you read Uncle Tom's cabin, he was a hero. He was not. A, they, they had even though you tell them the truth that they have it wrong. The character Sambo, not Tom. They still won't correct the wrong because it just sounds better. So if you have a group that will feel like that, you need a Kanye West to shock the system to be able to say, you know what? I'm not going to walk back like Chance the Rapper. I believe something as simple as you don't have to vote Democrat. I don't know how that's making me evil, but you're not going to force me back. And his friends tried to do that to him. His friends told him, well, look, um, your fans stuck with you through the whole Taylor Swift incident when white people were attacking you and you're going to do this to them. Your fans are going to walk away from me. He said, so you're threatening me now. Is that what you're doing? You're threatening me with the idea of loss of income or fans because of my political decision. So hence, I shouldn't do it. Whatever you do, Kanye, don't be a thought leader. Do not be, do not think independently of the crowd of the herd. And, and if you try, we're going to punish you. We're going to brand you publicly with a horrible label and we're going to try and destroy your income. We're going to just try and destroy your reputation. I mean, I hate to use the word lynching because that's a very, very powerful word. But as far as high tech digital online lynching, it doesn't that's seem exactly to me to is. be wildly different from that. It's exactly what it is. When you can force individuals to think we don't want to know what a person really thinks. My grandmother used to say to me all the time, she said, I liked it better when the Klan wore hoods. I don't like it now because they're wearing suits. <laughs> As a kid, I didn't get it. And I grew up, I said, I get what she's saying now. She respected the fact that she knew who, who thought what, so you would know how to deal with them. Now, if everything looks the exact same, but so you can't tell who is who, everybody's saying publicly what they think they're supposed to say, that makes for a boring world. Everybody <laughs> has to like trannies. You have to think a transsexual is attractive. If you say a transsexual is not your cup of tea, there's a, a, a singer named Genuine who was called homophobic because on a television show, a transsexual man tried to kiss him. He would uh, was a, a, a man that turned himself into a woman, tried to kiss him. He refused to. It was a huge story that he was homophobic. But if a man tried to kiss a woman unwarranted like that, it be as an assault. So why is it that this guy can be called a hom homophobic and transphobic, which I don't understand what any of these things are because he didn't seem scared of the person when they walked in. He just didn't want to engage in a sexual act. But he still called a bad person for not wanting to enjoy this. This is the society we're in and Kanye West is being lynched digitally like many people, like Genuine was. You're being forced to now say, oh, I find him attractive. If, it, if I wasn't in a relationship with a with a person, I would sure go after this guy. He has to say this now. Like, we don't want to know that he's not interested in that. So then if the world knew, then all the people who were that would know not to go after him because he's not interested in it. As a black guy, I can say I don't find white women attractive at all. And I would be able to still be on NBC, ABC. I would never get any problem happen to me. But if you said, oh, well, I, I, I don't have a problem with black women. I'm just not interested. I'm. I like to have my grandchildren look like me and my granddad. You are an immediate racist. Oh, so you have this great bit which you've talked about before about how you post the picture of the uh, pretty black woman and say, "Well, you you say it. It's a yeah. it's a great bit." I do it every year and I, and I love it and it works. I'll put up a picture of a pretty black woman and be like, "Black women are the most beautiful women on earth." There'll be white women who will come on the post and thumbs up that post. I will come back a few weeks later because we know the people have a short memory, and I'll put up. White women are the most beautiful women on earth. And I'll get flooded with hate. You hate your mom. You hate yourself. And I'm thinking, but you just accepted this one thing, which was saying the same thing, except on the opposite. But you accepted that. And the liberals have taught white people so much. That's why I came up with the guiltless campaign, that you fear being labeled a racist. It's a, it's a third rail. You will do anything to not be labeled a racist. So they will come to this picture of me saying black women are the most beautiful women in the world. And they will thumbs up that picture because they feel like they have to. And it's also they know that this is a snack pack thrower 
and you got to give them because I tell you what, I've never won a gold medal, but I'm never in my life will be envious of the guy who won eight gold medals in the Special Olympics. Because what situation did he have to be in in order to even compete in the Special Olympics? But it's the equivalent of WNBA. WNBA has never made a dime ever in its in its history. All of the money that they have to even operate comes from the men. Yet we want to believe and be told that women are just as good as men. Well, then why can't they finance their own stuff? Why can't you tell in these colleges if the women's lacrosse team doesn't make enough money from ticket sales to exist, it should not exist. But they kicked some baseball teams who were financially solvent on their own, that they were able to stay afloat on their own. They had to get rid of those programs because they had to take the money that was going that they were generating and give it to the women because they the title nine, I think it's called. Um, where there has to be as many men as women's sports. And you look at that with Kanye West. You look at what this man is coming out and trying to say, hey, look, if we really are diverse as black people, stop letting them pigeonhole us and say, oh, the Democrats say, we know we got your vote, so we didn't even have to work for it. Blacks don't even realize Democrats don't even work for their vote anymore. We say, well, the white whites over in the Republican side, they don't do anything for blacks. Well, what did Barack Obama do for you? This doesn't make sense. But they're ignoring it. And it's easy to get them to ignore it because if you put a D beside them, we're supposed to vote for it. I've seen when I was growing up, I watched D, 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 D all the way down. Democrat, Democrat. They didn't know who he was. There are more people more offended at my videos than they are offended at what their public officials are doing in their actual life. That's crazy. Well, here's the thing, too. So the, the term racism generally means to to have a collective judgment, usually negative, about a race, right? Now, if... You have to vote Democrat if you're black. And, and if you're a Republican, then how is it not, how is it impossible then to look and say, well, you know, the blacks are going to vote Democrat, so that's a problem for me. And we want diversity of thought within the black community because that pushes against these collective judgments of similarity. We want as much diversity as possible in every group so that we can push back against these collective judgments and say, well, no, there's a huge amount of diversity. You can't judge this group collectively. But it's like everybody who says you don't have to vote Democrat gets run off the rails. And it's like, OK, well, I guess now we're giving people carte blanche to, to judge blacks collectively because they're not allowed to have diversity. Oh, it's frustrating. Yeah. It <laughs> Imagine being a conservative to where if you say during the campaign, that that train has already left the station. There's no sense in putting out any ads or going to any black neighborhoods. They're going to vote Democrat. But if you say that openly, you just became a racist. Yet Chance the Rapper said you don't have to vote Democrat. And he got. Yes. Yeah, so it makes no sense that if one side is supposed to continue to try to fight to get a group that is going to keep saying no. It's the equivalent of saying there's this girl who, you know, has openly told everybody, I'm not going to give you a chance if you ask me to prom. So you you tell your friends, I'm not going to ask her. She's not going to go to prom with me. <gasps> How dare you say you're not going to give her the attention she needs? She still <laughs> likes knowing that you want to take her. She wants to be able to reject you. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's these impossible situations. They drive me crazy. The, like you can't you can't win. You can't win. Like no matter what you do, like, well, I'm not going to ask her out because she's not interested in me. <gasps> you hate women. It's like. Oh, so now I've got to go shred my ego on some woman who's going to freeze me out. Or I hate women. Excellent. I can't wait to play this game again tomorrow. <laughs> and you wonder why men just go ahead and just because they're like, well, I can't win this game. I literally can't win. If I want to be in my child, my job is to want to be in my child's life every day. So the government can tell me I can only see him once every other weekend. That's my job, though. I should want to put myself in that position. Now, if she wants to go out and smoke crack and become a prostitute, then I should be there to take care of the child uh, because she doesn't want to do it anymore because as a good man, I should be there. But if she wants to come back in a few years, if she's cleaned the crack out of her system and no longer wants to do that, then I have to give the child back because I'm being a poor dad that I'm keeping that child from the mother. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute. When does the guy win? He doesn't. I've just, I think as we get I gotta tell you, I just, I just had this mm -hmm. image of going to a store in the mall uh, in the Mother's Day cards and, and just picking one up, peeling it up and saying, Mom, I'm so glad you cleaned the crack out of your system. Happy Mother's <laughs> Day. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's close with, with, let me throw you a nice challenge here. Uh, you can take it. You can handle it. Um, where are you in terms of the moral of the Cosby story. I know it's real tough to boil it down to one. I mean, we've been talking for like over an hour and a half and, and it's been great chat, but where do you sit with like the takeaway that's sort of boiled down from this Cosby story where it stands at the moment? Here's the takeaway. 
we need to stop this idea that men feel empowered by having money that they can now do whatever they want to do to anyone. One. Two, we also need to watch this slippery slope that we're going down, that we've over empowered women to just have vindictive reasons, whether it's a money motive or whether it's a revenge motive to harm people, to harm people that they feel deserve it. Many of us feel like Walmart can deal with us stealing because they're so big, they're not going to miss the money. And I think we're starting to look at men who have been presented as a business, that it is a business and that what you do to this man, he can handle it. And we don't pay attention to the fact that there's so many men who can't handle it. That's why the suicide rate amongst men is so high because no one cares for them. So we can care for women, but let's not throw away men and discard the emotional status of men because the Me Too movement should include all of us as humans. Me Too. If we've been treated poorly and unfairly, we should all care about how that human has been treated. Not say that a man has the greater capacity for pain, discomfort, and displeasure than women. Not say that the world is better when women are comforted. Not keep saying these sayings like happy wife, happy life, when there's no opposite saying. What this needs to do is show us that we as men need to understand that there is a coming witch hunt. And if we don't stand up every now and again, not for people who've done wrong, not for Bill Cosby's and what they've done wrong, but we do need to stand up for over policing of one side and under regulating of the other. So any moral that would come out of this would be this is there is no true equality here in the United States amongst the sexes. And it won't be until we can have a real discussion. You cannot look at men and say, what did he do to cause this? But if I ever said that towards a rape victim, you'd think I was crazy. I would be wrong. I need to be shut down. A woman can walk down a dark alley at three in the morning, naked and drunk and laying around on the floor and saying, I wish somebody could come take me. But if you go do it, you're still wrong. You were supposed to have self-control. Yet we don't allow women or put them in the same boat to say, have self-control. This is showing us that we can overreach, we can witch hunt a man. We don't know the difference between the Bill Cosby's and the Brian Banks, one completely innocent, one looking like he did something, but both being treated the same. And even when we find out one lied, we protect the, the accuser more than the accused. And that's not right. So hopefully it will open up more eyes to people saying, just because you see him on television and he's nice, doesn't mean he's nice in his personal life. You don't know that person. Number two, just because you think someone did something wrong doesn't mean you're right either. Let's try to have real conversations about race, sex, anything. That's what needs to happen. Beautifully put. I'm not even going to try and top that. Magnificent. All right. Just wanted to put a plug in. Remember to check out Soto Mayor, S-O-T-O-M-A-Y-O-R-E-N-T.com or Sotomayor.com. You can't ever dip into one of Tommy's videos without coming out shocked and enlightened, which is to me the perfect combination. I don't want to just be enlightened. I also want to feel like I've just been hit with some electrical truth. And and you speak uh, truth in, in a challenging environment uh, just about as much, if not more than just about anyone I know. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Really appreciate the conversation today. Uh, everyone, let us know what you like or don't like in the comments below. And um, I look forward to talking again soon. Hey, I'm honored, brother. Anytime you need me here, I'm here. Thanks.